All righty. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And if you would, grab your Bible and turn it to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we are going to continue um, our study of the armor of God together. Um, this is actually, we're going to be in verse 17 today. This is actually the last verse in this passage on the actual armor of God. Okay, now we're not done with the passage. Uh, next Sunday is Mother's Day and uh, our plan is for Bud to open the Word on Mother's Day. Then the two Sundays after Mother's Day we're going to have a teaching on the following verses here in the passage, verses 18 through 20. Um, it's about prayer. So we're going to see what God has for us as far as the role of prayer in our spiritual battle, our uh, spiritual warfare. So that's going to be exciting. There's other things on the horizon as well. Um, but for now, we're going to conclude the list of the actual pieces of the armor of God in verse 17. Now, um, just I'm going to keep this intro very quick. Okay, so if you've missed any of these sermons on the armor of God, I just encourage you, go to the YouTube channel and listen to them. Because every one of these pieces of armor is so important. And the reason why they're important, guys, is because we are in the spiritual war that we're in. And this passage, starting in verse 10, verses 10 through, through 13, really, tells us a lot of significant things. It tells, who's our enemy, uh, tells us who our enemy is, and it tells us what God wants us to do in order to stand firm against Him, in order to resist Him. And there's, there's two things that God says in this passage. He says, look, first of all, you've got to know that your power is the Lord's strength. You're not fighting this war on your own, in your own strength. So that's our power. He also says, you've got to fight this war, these battles, right? The war is won. Christ won the war on the cross. So uh, Colossians uh, chapter 2 tells us that, that Jesus on the cross, He literally disarmed these powers of darkness, these forces of evil. Um, he uh, triumphed over the evil one. But we have battles to face. We face them in the Lord's power, and His strength, and also we're to face them with the Lord's armor. So we have His power and His protection. And as we look at these pieces of armor, because we've got to know what they are, we know what to put on. He says, put on and keep on. Well, what are they? Let's just go through them. Belt of truth. That was the first one. Uh, that was verse 14. This is what we cinch our lives up with, God, uh, guys, what is true. Not what is a figment of our imagination, but what is real. And in verse 14, he also says you need a breastplate. The breastplate of righteousness. That's, that's what protects the two areas that Satan will hit us in. That's our mind, our thinking, and our emotions. Right? So the, the breastplate of righteousness covers our hearts and our minds. And then verse 15, he says you also need the right shoes. You need to put on those boots of peace. And we learn that we're at peace with God now, if we're in Christ. But we also have the peace of God, and that's a very significant thing. And then in verse 16, he says, oh, by the way, you also need a shield. And then I think this is probably, this is what we saw last Sunday. This might be the most important one on the list. The shield of faith. Because we've got these barrage of arrows. They're not just arrows, they're flaming arrows. They've got the, the, the flame on the end. Right? It's, 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 uh, when they come at us, the, the design of the evil one is to not just penetrate us, but also to splatter fire on the ones around us. So he says, look, you've got to have a shield that where you can treat the times of uncertainty as if they were absolutely certain. That's what faith does, because you know who's in charge. And we exercise our faith simply by this, guys. We, we take God at His word. We believe who He is. We believe what He says. Um, and believing in who God is and what He says, that's, that's taking up the shield of faith. And it covers us from head to toe. So, applying what we believe about God to the issues of life. That was last Sunday. Now, we're going to go on in verse 17 and we're saying okay well let's see we got a breastplate we got a belt we got boots we got a shield what else do we need Paul and he says we need two other things you need a helmet and you need a sword a helmet and a sword look at verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God before we go and dive into those two pieces of armor, let's bow, let's pray, let's ask God to teach us today. Lord, you've been so faithful to go through each of these pieces of armor along with us, and you've been faithful to teach us and show us vividly what you're talking about. Not a whole lot of words for each of these in description, but each one of them has such depth of meaning. 
And God, I just thank you for that. I, I thank you, God, that, um, Lord, you, you reminded us that it's not our own strength that we fight, this spiritual war, these spiritual battles. Um, but then you give us a practical list of things that here's what I provided for you. This is your protection. And all of these things simply don't just come from you, Lord. They are you. Lord Jesus, you are the embodiment of every single one of these things. And so we ask you once again to meet us here. Holy Spirit, this is your pulpit. We ask you to take this time, redeem it, Lord, for your glory and our good. And Lord, tell us what exactly this helmet of salvation is. Tell us what the sword of the Spirit is. Tell us, Lord, not only what it is, to define what it is, but also tell us how to use it. Show us, give us some insights today, Holy Spirit, and how do we do exactly what you're saying to do with the sword and with the helmet. So, God, we just look to you to, today, as we always do, to teach us. Lord, we want to be available to your voice. Your sheep hear your voice. And when your sheep hear your voice, God, powerful things happen. And we want to change the world, Lord. And we want to do it with your power, with your armor on, with your gospel. And we want to help build the kingdom of the living God, the creator of this universe. That's the ultimate meaning of life. So again, we ask you to speak to us and teach us and disciple us today in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. Helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. We're going to take each of these one at a time. And hopefully, God willing, we're going to finish this out today. That's the plan. So let's look at the helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. Taking notes, just write that at the top there. Helmet of salvation. I love that there's no elaboration. It just says, and take the helmet of salvation. By the way, the, by the, way, the word take is to receive. Uh, it just means to accept. And it, so literally, you, you put it on. And that's what he's saying. You need to put on the helmet of salvation. Nothing else was said about the helmet of salvation. You notice that? So it's up to us to understand what exactly is he talking about. And the reason why this is something that's not so easy is because salvation is a pretty big word, not in terms of number of letters, but in terms of depth of meaning. And so here's what we want to do, guys. I want us to stop, and I want us to kind of go off on a road a little bit. I want us to have an understanding of the theology of this word salvation. Okay? Because, frankly, sometimes, you know, so the, the Word of God brings up this word salvation a lot. And there are moments when the wrong type of salvation is used or understood to be the meaning there. So we have to get our, our ducks in a row when it comes to what does he mean by salvation. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write down that there are three, we'll call them, um, I don't know, we'll call them dimensions of salvation. Okay? And here they are, and then we'll go through them. There is a past kind of salvation. There is a present type of salvation. And there is a future kind of salvation. Past, present, future. And with each one of these dimensions or kinds or whatever, there's a theological term that we can attach to it. And I think you'll be blessed by this. So let's, let's, all, let's be all in here, guys. So put on your thinking caps and open your hearts to the Lord because this is going to be pretty profound. So, past. And we're, again, we're, we're wondering, so Paul, what do you mean, Lord, what do you mean when you say take up the helmet of salvation? Is he talking about past salvation? Is he talking about present salvation? Or is he talking about future salvation? Let me define for you what they are. Our past salvation is, um, well, let's just say it's conversion. And the theological term we'll, we'll use for that is justification, and I'll d define that in a second. But listen, um, if you're saved, okay, then here in the space of time, this moment of conversion is a past event, is it not? In other words, we don't get saved today, and then, oh, we do bad stuff, and then we get saved again tomorrow. Oh, we do bad stuff, and then we have to get saved again. Conversion happens how many times? Once. It happens once. Okay, this is the come to senses moment for the prodigal. Remember that? He's eating pig slop, and all of a sudden he comes to his senses. He looks up from the trough and he says, what am I doing? And he thinks about it immediately. Who do you think about? His father. And he repents. He turns his mind, his heart, turned back to his dad. 
That's the moment of his conversion. Conversion, guys, is, so it, it can't be what Paul is talking about here, because if it was conversion, then it wouldn't come, first of all, it wouldn't come fifth on the list. It'd be first. Oh, and by the way, it already was addressed in Ephesians. Ephesians, the first three chapters of Ephesians, tell us, here is what Jesus has done for you. This is what God has done for you. In chapter 2, he says, you were once dead in your sins, but God saved you. Right? You were saved not by works, but by grace through faith. See, he's already addressed that. And even if he hadn't, it certainly wouldn't come down the list. And he's talking to people who love Jesus, okay? So this is not that salvation. But I do want you to understand that past salvation is pretty important. In fact, I, I, I know I'm talking to you uh, about this and this past salvation thing. And let me just address some of the people who might be listening today. And we've got people in this room that are listening. We've also got people that are you know, watching here on the computer and watching on Facebook and watching on YouTube. Maybe this isn't a done deal for you. I hear people a lot say things like, I've always been a Christian. And I'm really confused about what that means. <laughs> okay, I, don't, I just don't think that's accurate. It's like saying, um, you know, when I was growing up, my parents were really into bowling. And when I was a kid, man, we used to go to the bowling alley all the time, and they were really good bowlers. And we just, I, I went there all the time. Every week we went to the bowling alley, and somebody said, well, are you a good bowler? Oh, no, I don't bowl. But my parents did. It was really important to us and as a family, but I don't bowl. And that may be a really bad analogy, but you understand what I'm saying. Some people treat their Christianity like that. Well, when I was a kid, I mean, my, my parents, we went to church all the time. It was really important to them. So we went to church. And uh, as a Christian church, oh really, are you a Christian? Well, uh, not really, but it was important to them. We treat it like it's a heritage thing, you know? That's not conversion. Conversion is that moment when, uh, when Romans describes conversion in uh, Romans 5.10. What, what, what does it say? Uh, actually, in Romans chapter 10, in verse 9, what does it say? It says that, first of all, in your heart there's been a choice that's been made. And that choice that's been made is, you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That means that you know He died for your sins, and He rose, and that alone is what you put your, your faith in for your forgiveness for sin. You believe that He did that. And then, out of that believing heart, your mouth confesses something. Because it's one thing to say, that's really cool that Jesus did all that. It's another thing to say, and I embrace it, I accept it, I receive it. I confess that Jesus is my Lord. That's the moment of conversion, guys. And the, uh, I guess the theological term for that is justification. What does that mean? Well, that means you're guilty, but the judge has decreed you, declared you not guilty. And he can do that because of what he did on the cross for us. We are declared not guilty. Not that we're not guilty, we're guilty, but because of salvation, because of that moment where you believe in your heart that He rose from the dead, and that you confess with your mouth that He is Lord, that then made you not guilty in the eyes of God. How about that? Praise God. So again, we ask ourselves, well, is that, the, is that what He's talking about here in verse 17? It is not. It is not. That's past. Let's talk about present. Let's talk about present salvation. There's a present dimension of it. And again, sometimes this gets a little bit twisted up in, in our thinking, but I want you to see it very clearly. So, the present dimension of salvation is Romans 5.10. Um, this is what, where it says that the believer has been saved by Christ's death, that we were once his enemies, but because of his death, we are brought back to God, and that we shall, and the, the verbiage there, we shall keep being saved by his life. That's the tense of the language in that verse. Keep being saved. And that may be kind of confusing. But if you understand that this keep being saved isn't conversion, but it's sanctification. That's the word we attach to present salvation. It's to be sanctified. Guys, that simply means that Jesus, every single day of our lives, is working to transform us into, into His image. He continues to conform us. He continues to you know, uh, transform our hearts and our being and our lives. He's purging. It's a daily purging of sin. And it's a continual purifying of His children practically. 
It's not that we need to be saved in our soul every, every time. No, we got the bath. See, that's, that's the thing. There's a great analogy of this built into Scripture for us. The time when Jesus said to his disciples, okay, guys, it's time for me to do what I've been telling you guys to do. I got to go and get things done. I got to die. I'll be raised from the dead three days later. He, he told them. And he says, now, guys, let's spend some time together. From John chapter 13 through John chapter 16, I believe, is this moment that Jesus has, this private moment that Jesus has with his disciples. And a lot went on in there. And one of the first things that Jesus did was he took down his robe and he tied it around his waist. And that right there is the posture of a slave, of a servant. And he says, fellas, it's time for me now to wash your feet. So he takes the posture of a servant. He takes his bowl, the sponge, and it goes around to each of the, the feet of the disciples, smelly feet. And he washes them. And he gets to Peter. And Peter says, uh-uh. No way you're washing my feet, Jesus. No way. I should be washing your feet. This should be the reverse. And Jesus says, well, Peter, listen, if you... Uh, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And what that means is our relationship is strained. There's something wrong between us. And Peter then responds, oh, well, then just give me a whole bath. And Jesus kind of went, oh, Peter. I'm sure he's thinking, uh, well, you know what I think he's thinking. But he says, um, Peter, you don't need a bath. That's done. You just need me to wash your feet. And what, he, what he's saying there is salvation, that's your bath. Right? That's when Jesus cleanses your, bat, your, your soul. You don't need to be washed in that sense. But what you do need is that every day, even with salvation, right? even with um, uh, the justification that's gone, even with the conversion, every day you're still walking inside this earth suit. And you're walking inside this dirty, filthy, dark planet. You know, guys, when we, after you take a shower and you're all cleaned up, and you put on your perfume or your cologne, and you brush your teeth, and you put on your clothes, and you're out in the world, and you're brand spanking new, yes? What happens, though, at the end of the day? What happens? You're dirty again. And in a spiritual sense, that's what he's saying. Every day you're walking out, you're clean, you're, your soul is cleaned up, but you've accumulated the dirt of sin all day long. So what do you do? You confess. You confess those sins. You come to me, as John, uh, 1 John 1, 9 talks about. You, you just come to me and you confess it. And, and Jesus is faithful. He is just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's sanctification. Right? Where we come to the Lord and we get cleaned up. And during the, the course of the day, and the course of the week, and the course of the month, and the course of the year, every day, every moment of every day is a day that Jesus works in your life to conform you and transform you more and more into His image. Everybody with me so far? Now the question is, is that the kind of salvation he's talking about in verse 17? It might be, but I don't think it is. I think there's no doubt about it, it's the third one. And listen closely, gang. This is future salvation. And the word you want to use for this one is this. Glorification. Glorification. This is referring to the hope of what is going to happen. The hope of something that hasn't been done yet, but that is guaranteed it will happen. I uh, know you've heard about this, this story about those three men. There was a football player and two other friends. They went fishing off the coast of Florida. The, the boat got taken by the tide and they're out in the middle of the ocean, literally in the middle of the ocean. The boat capsized. There's three men on that boat. Two of them died. When they found this guy, I don't know, it was days later. I don't know how long it took, but it was a long time. They found this man, the last guy aboard. He was, the boat was capsized. He was clinging to the, the top of the boat. And he thought he was dead, but he was alive. And when everything happened, they got him out and they took him back to Florida and they were interviewing him days later and they said, what kept you alive? And he said, it was the hope that I would see my family again. Do you know that hope is extremely powerful? And when we don't have it, life is extremely difficult. So what did Jesus do? 
he kept building into his word, kept pouring into his word, saying this, you have the hope of glory, church. You have the hope of glory, the hope of glory, the hope of glory. What does that mean? That means what 1 Corinthians 15 talks about. That means this. You know, you're walking around in this dirty earth suit, and you've got to get cleansed every day. You've got to get that foot washing every day. You know what? Someday there's going to be a day when the presence of sin is gone. So the power of sin, that's gone. Jesus took care of that on the cross and when he saved you. Um, the power of sin, that's been taken care of also. Guys, sin, honestly, we have to embrace this. Sin doesn't have any power over us anymore if we're in Christ. Okay? So that's taken care of also. Our penalty is taken care of. The power of sin is taken care of. One thing it's not taken care of yet, and that's the presence of sin. And what I mean by that is we still got this suit. We carry around every day. We're still living in this world. And God is going to take care of both of those things. He's going to usher in a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to crinkle this one up and bring in something new without sin. And 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how he's going to take these bodies and do away with them and give us brand new bodies, sinless, immortal bodies. It's all going to happen, guys, when Jesus comes back for us. And here's the reality. Let me read you something from 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Listen to this. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what will be. We know that when Jesus appears, we will be like Him, because he will see, we will see Him, Jesus, just as He is. And everyone who has this hope... Fix it on Him and purifies Himself just as He is pure. That encompasses what future hope, what glorification is all about. We have, guys, the hope of glory. We have a guarantee. In fact, it was stamped on us before the foundation of the planet that we would be glorified. We're going to not just enter into a place where there's the glory of Christ, but, guys, the glory of Christ, we will share in that. That's why we'll get a crown. But you know what we're going to do with those crowns? We're going to throw it back at Him. Because we worship Him in purity. But think about it. Beloved, think about it. And it's not just the presence of sin. You know, it's the results of sin that we face every day, that we're content with every day. I heard somebody once say that sin is our constant companion right now. You need to think about it. It really is. It's not just the thoughts we struggle with. It's not just the, the stuff we hear in the world that we struggle with. Guys, it's everything we struggle with, all the results of sin. This is why we have trouble with our physical being, and our physical bodies, when we break down. You know what that's a result of? Sin. And we, we fear death, and we fear others dying. You know what death is a result of? Sin. So think about every day that we contend with, not just our own sins and not just the sins of others that hurt us and we hurt them, but it's everything. It's the, the whole world groans because it's longing for the day that Jesus comes back and takes care of this presence of sin. The hope is that one day the presence of sin and the results of sin, all the mourning, the crying, the pain we suffer, it will be no more. It will be gone and forgotten. So what do we do? We do what he says to do in so many of the scriptures uh, that we see, right? We keep our eyes focused up where Jesus is. Guys, we, we long for the day when our Lord comes back and there's a great reunion in the sky. And this stuff is gone. So I think what he's talking about there here, here is that we are to have a helmet of hope. That's what we put on. Now you're asking yourself, okay, wait a minute, why a helmet? So why does he use the, the analogy of a helmet for this future thing? Well, that's a great question. And let me answer this by first directing your attention to the analogy of a soldier, which is, I think, what Paul wants us to see. So a Roman soldier, they would never go out without their helmet because the enemies they faced had what's called a, bro a broadsword. A broadsword. And I'm putting my hands together like this because this sword was so big Four feet long, up to four feet long, the sword. Heavy. And it usually took a man, a strong man, two hands to, to wield this sword. And if you saw a soldier just wielding a four-foot sword with one hand, you know it's going to be a long day because that guy is strong. But these guys would hold it with two hands, and that is what they would direct at their head. 
So if you didn't have a helmet that could withstand the blow from a sword like that, it was done. It was over. One blow is all it takes. And I think Paul wants us to see something. Our enemy swings a big, threatening, spiritual sword at us. And, and, and I was thinking about this this morning, because last week we saw these flaming arrows. Yeah? And you think of all the flaming arrows. They come at us fast and furious, right? They have all these, just a barrage of them. And sometimes it's, I'm scared because, you know, my job is, you know, I'm just scared of what's going to happen to us financially. Oh, I'm scared about this person that they keep, you know, making life hard on me. I, I, I'm really scared about this person because, you know, they're, they're, they're not doing well. Oh, and I had this pain in my side and I got to go get that checked out. I got to continue with this and go to my doctor. And those are the flaming arrows. And then Paul directs us, he says, now... Don't forget your helmet, because Satan doesn't just use arrows, he uses a broadsword. And the broadsword, I think, is this, guys. You know, everybody alive, everybody who's ever lived in this planet, knows the feeling and knows that there's that one area, that deep part of your heart, there's that one place and when, that, when Satan gets you there, you can barely stand up. And I know a lot of people, a lot of Christians, we, uh, we could take the arrows, and we have our faith guarding us, and we get through that, and we can maintain. And, but then there's that one blow that Satan yields at us, wields at us, and it just seems to crush us. If we don't have our helmet on, that's exactly what it'll do. It's that one thing. Nobody, nobody even knows about it in a lot of cases. Sometimes you'll, you'll let that one area you know, out. Maybe you'll see a counselor or maybe you'll, somebody you trust and you talk about it with them, but it barely comes out. It's just something that, you know, the quietness of your heart. Not the quietness so much of your heart, but you're, not, you're just not loud about it to others. But it's that place that when Satan swings the sword there, it puts you on your knees and not in a good way. You know, I, I, um, I was thinking about this this morning. The Lord gave this to me this morning. He, I, I literally hadn't thought about this young man until this morning. Just boom, there he was. But when I was in high school, there was a, a boy. I'll just, I'm going to call him Derek. His name was Derek, but I won't share his last name. But Derek and I were friends. We went to different middle schools. And we came to uh, the same high school together and, as freshmen. And, uh, you know, at first, he and I were kind of like... Um, we weren't that popular. You know, we knew people. And, but um, as the ninth grade went on, Derek got more and more popular. And then by the time 10th grade rolled around, Derek is probably the most popular guy in the whole school. He's a 10th grader. And even the juniors and seniors loved him. And he won awards. He, he, he won the, whatever the award for, you know, best whatever. And, you know, at the end of the year, he got uh, to be king of this or whatever. I mean, this, this guy, everybody loved Derek. Derek had a smile on his face all the time. There was not a person in that school that didn't love Derek. You know, Derek and I, we'd talk about uh, some of our, the junk we were going through in life, and he was always there for me. We were very close friends. I think Derek was close with a lot of people. One day, it was, it was May 1985. This was not too long after I got saved. And I walked into the school, and every girl is crying. And some of the boys are too. And there's not a teacher, there's not anybody in the hallways or in any place in the school that didn't have a solemn look on their face. And I went, what is going on? And I asked somebody, what's happening? He said, you didn't hear? I no. He said, Derek killed himself. And so the, when you hear about that, the first questions you ask were, what? How? Why? The how wasn't too pretty. It was pretty gruesome. But the why was even more gruesome. See, nobody knew. His parents didn't know. His siblings didn't know. His closest friends didn't know. Nobody knew that place inside of him that had gotten so discouraged that it wasn't even worth living anymore. And by the way, I'd shared the gospel with my friend Derek, and he never received it, as far as I know. He left a note, and the note, I'm paraphrasing, simply said, I can no longer live with me.
You know, guys, sometimes that one place in our hearts, that one place where the, the evil one is swinging that broadsword, it might be that place where, you know, you, you have this grave fear of losing somebody. And, man, if you lose that person, you just know you can't go on. And I had to face that when my wife had COVID. I told you guys about that. That was my area. So for, some, for some of us, it's that when others lose hope, we lose hope. When others are damaged and they, you, you kid, you're doing everything you can, and sometimes you don't even know about it, but you've heard they're losing hope, and that just causes you to get down on your knees. I think for lots of people, it's, it's they, they, how they feel about themselves. That they can try to maintain something as best they can, but then when Satan comes with that broadsword, and they just hate themselves so deeply, and they can't, they just can't do it. You know, um, one thing about Satan is he never stops. Guys, we fight, but we get tired. Satan never gets tired. And I think a lot, of, a lot of believers bail out. They go AWOL. And they bail out because Satan's sword has crushed their head. They have no hope. Beloved, this is why Paul says, put your helmet on. Put the helmet of the hope that you have on. And this hope is not in yourself, and it's not in your friends, and it's not in your circumstances, and it's not in anything you can see on this planet. Remember Colossians? Look up, guys. In fact, he didn't just say look. He says, set your hearts on things above where Jesus is. Don't set your heart on things here. Don't do it. Because the moment that you count on anybody or anything on this planet, that's when you will go down. We've got to keep our helmet on, guys. We've got to keep looking up. It's Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time you will reap if you don't grow weary. Keep your helmet on. That helmet of hope. Listen, as bad as it can get, let's never forget that Jesus is coming back for us. That's not just this pie in the sky thing. Guys, that's reality. Why do you think Satan has tried to convince so many that after you live and you die, that's it? That you just live your life and then when you die, there's nothing else. Why do you think he's trying so hard to convince people of that and so many people have bought that? Because he's trying to steer us away from the hope that no, that's not how this works. We live and he's coming back for us. We live, and when we die, paradise. I heard someone say once, the test of anybody's character is what it takes to stop them. You know, and some people, doesn't take much to stop them. Other people, takes a lot to stop them. But Paul is reminding us, no, we shouldn't ever be stopped in the first place. So the helmet of salvation protects us from fainting, from giving up, from growing weary. Why? Because you have a hope, and your hope is that there's light at the end of this darkness. And right now, we can just see the crack, right? We can see the, the light peering in. One day, that light that we barely see, guys, we're gonna be, it's going to be the air we breathe. It'll be our atmosphere that we live in and exist in. That's our hope. And then... Let's spend just the rest of our time here on the second thing, which is the sword of the Spirit. He says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Notice it's capital S. And he does give us a little description. He says, which is the Word of God. Now, when he says sword here, don't picture a broadsword, the four-foot kind. Picture a dagger. Picture something that's between 6 and 18 inches in length. This is the same kind of uh, dagger that uh, Malchus, uh, remember him? Uh, I'm sorry, not Malchus, but Peter. He uh, pulled out his dagger and he cut Malchus's ear off. You remember that? Okay, picture that kind of sword. It's a dagger. That's what he's trying to, to uh, let us see. Um, this was also used in battle, but it was a sword or a knife or a dagger of precision. 
So when he says you need to pull out the sword of the, of the Spirit, this is a precise weapon. It's a, a weapon of preciseness or precision. By the way, capital S, what does that always signify? The Holy Spirit. There's a reminder right there, gang. The Word of God is who authored the Word of God. Second Peter chapter 1 even tells us, no prophecy of Scripture was ever given by man's own interpretation, but men moved by the Spirit of God wrote it down. So the Word of God, it's the Spirit, right? It's the sword of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And it's a weapon of precision. And the key here, gang, is there's nothing wrong with the weapon. There's nothing wrong with the equipment. It's how we use it that comes into question. Okay? We've got to know how to use it. The church in general has lost its way in knowing how to use the sword. God's Word is a great weapon. But you know how to use it. Do we, as a church, know how to use it? Um, Romans 1.16 tells us how powerful this sword is, by the way. You know, this sword, it's a weapon that can literally cut right through Satan's dominion and tear people's souls away from darkness. The gospel. Um, that's powerful. Uh, the Word of God tells us, Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is, listen, living and active. That means it's alive. You know what the Word of God, you're, you're reading the, the Word, right? You're reading the ink on the paper. But God has this wonderful thing, this way of taking what you read, storing it in your heart, and you walk into the day, and guess what He does? You're meditating on it. You're churning over it. And what He does is He speaks to your heart. He uses the circumstances and His providence to speak to your heart. He, he will take the, the Word of God, which is written. But remember, Jesus was called... The Word in John chapter 1, He's Logos, He's the living Word. It's alive, guys. It's not just when you open it up and read it at your table in the ink. It comes alive and it's active. It actively does things in your life. And He says also in Hebrews 4.12 that it's sharper than any other sword. And it divides soul and spirit. It's able to judge men's thoughts and his intentions. That means motives of the heart. Guys, this sword judges men's hearts and saves men's souls. It's an offensive weapon. But it's also defensive. And please hear this. You know, in uh, Matthew 4 and Luke 4, in the beginning of those chapters in the Gospels, Jesus was sent out to the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil. Just a personal encounter. Jesus and the evil one. And if you remember, Satan's trying really hard. Man, he's doing all he can because Jesus hadn't eaten for a while and he's weak. And so Satan comes at him and says, hey, if you're so hungry, make that uh, stone come to, uh, become bread. Now what Jesus does here is he doesn't just say something in general. You know, what he does is he pulls out his dagger and with precision he cuts that lie in half. He cuts that temptation, I should say, in half. Uh, he uses Deuteronomy 8.3. He said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from God. That was precisely using the word to cut that temptation in half. Satan's not done. Here's what Satan does next. He actually, Satan, uses the word of God. He uses the same dagger trying to use it against Jesus. He says, well, if you're the Son of God, jump off this mountain and call God's angels to catch you. And that's actually a quote from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. You can read it. So he's trying to use the Word of God to tempt the Word of God. By the way, on that note, you've got to be aware that Satan uses the sword too. You understand that? Satan takes the Bible and uses it, tries to use it against us, twists it, turns it, but he uses it. So what does Jesus do? He quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. It is written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. And then one final time, <laughs> Satan says, hey, Jesus, check out all of this, all these kingdoms. Worship me, and they're all yours. And again, Jesus pulls out the sword, and he said, Deuteronomy 6.13, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Precision, man. Precise. Cutting up of the lies that Satan threw at him. And man, every time, Satan's using a broad sword. Just trying so hard. 
But Jesus uses a dagger and wins. Here's the thing. We have the same weapon Jesus did in those moments. The same precise dagger that he used, he gave to us. And that's a reminder here. Take up your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Use it. Use it. Defend yourself. Whatever angle the temptation comes, the, the broad sword will come and that helmet is on. But then that's the defensive part. We have to be offensive. You know, guys, I, I was thinking about this this morning. When Lisa and I first got married, uh, we, we got married in 1993, and then for seven months we lived uh, just trying to be married uh, on our own understanding. We had no idea, no clue how to be married. And we certainly didn't have any clue how God wanted us to be married. Then we came to Colorado, and I think we were, it's safe to say, we were on the brink of splitting up. Already. Seven months. That's all it took. That's how much of a jerk I am, you know? Notice that I put it on myself. Brownie points. <laughs> um, but it's, it's true. Come on. My wife gets saved weeks into coming here to Colorado. And we're now a part of a body. And immediately, what God does is He takes His Word and He teaches us how to be married. And He taught me. You know, if you want your wife... See, your wife's like a flower. So she's either going to wither or she's going to blossom according to what you or do or don't do. And he pointed to Ephesians, ironically, Ephesians chapter 5. Love and cherish your wife and she'll blossom. And then he taught, you know, the Word of God. Jesus taught us, taught my wife, you know, if you, if you want your, your, your husband to be a knight in shining armor and not a nobody, you've got to respect him. And what are we doing? We're looking at the Word of God. This is, we're being taught. So we know now what the Word of God says, and so we're able then to use the sword. And, and just be reminded, it's not just knowing it. Guys, are we going to obey it? And are we going to use it? It's applying the specifics of the Word of God to those specific areas of temptation and tensions. And I'm just using my marriage with my wife as an example. But it's knowing. That's why there should be a hunger for the Word. Hunger to know God, know what He says, and know what He wants me to do. We all have to be in training on how to use the sword. And again, isn't it great of God that His Word, He'll speak to our hearts. He'll speak to us through the body. He'll certainly speak to us through the written Word. But the Word is alive and it's active. So take up your, your, your sword, the sword of the Spirit. Guys, he, he wants us to put on the helmet of hope in the Lord, and He wants us to use the sword of the Spirit of the Lord. And that's how He closes the, the armor. All right, I'm done. But let me just say this. In closing, you know, I showed you last week that picture Remember of the, the Roman cohort, you know, and there's a, a group of them, probably like 20 soldiers, and they have their shields on top, and they had their shields in front, and their shields on the side. And somebody in our discussion time last week remarked, yeah, but what about the back? Remember that? And I was thinking about this th this week, and I was thinking, here's how we get the back covered, because the back's not covered. You know, you don't have people, you know, holding the shield like this. What, what covers the back is another troop. And behind that one is another one. And another one. In other words, who has your back? Other soldiers do. We have each other's back. Now, Satan's going to try to come from behind and stick us in the ribs or the, between the shoulder blades in the back, but we're not going to let that happen. But, beloved, what are we using? I mean, if we're going to have each other's back, don't we need to know about what God says? If we're going to have each other's back, don't, don't we have to have our lives cinch up with truth so that when we're trying to help somebody, we're not just giving them opinions of the world? Don't we have to help each other by, I got my breastplate on, and, and, I, and God's got to guard my own heart and emotions. I mean, don't, don't we have each other's back when we, we're not just out there barefoot, but we got the shoes of peace on? And man, I'm dug in because I know I'm at peace with God and I've got the peace of God. And some, somebody in the body is having troubles with that, but I'm dug in. I mean, are we, are we 
helping each other out. We've got each other's back when our shields are up. And those arrows are coming. But we say, I got you, brother. I got you, sister. And we certainly got each other's back when we put our helmet on. And man, we spur each other on with love and good deeds because we know that deceit comes and discouragement comes and weariness comes and we all experience it at some level. But we are there to help one another out because we have hope. And sometimes it's just a general reminder of saying, brother, don't forget you have hope even in this. Sister, don't forget you've got hope even in this situation. And certainly, certainly, we don't just swing the sword by ourselves. Guys, we swing it together. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the armor of God. We thank you for your armor. And Father, I just pray, God, please help us to take these messages, take these, these different pieces of armor that we have put on and that we want to keep on. God, help us now live out these things by your power. Lord, teach us how to use the sword. All of us have room to grow there. God, teach us how to hear your voice. God, teach us how to keep the helmet on and not, not lose heart, not grow weary. A lot of times it's our own guilt and our own shame that seems to just bring us to our knees and sometimes it's so profound that people can't do it anymore. Lord, don't let us get there. Don't let us not see you in heaven, Lord. That's where the eyes of our heart must be pointed and must be fixed. And Lord, when our brother or sister is down, Lord, help us pull their chin back up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.